It's good to see everyone this morning. Let's go ahead and begin our study. Before we do that, we'll go to our Heavenly Father in word of prayer, and I'll ask Dale if you would direct our minds in that prayer. Our most loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee so much for this day and for the many blessings You've given us, especially the spiritual blessings and the promise of everlasting life and we'll be faithful to Thee. We're thankful, Father, that we can come together to be with brothers and sisters in Christ and share a common love for Thee, and we're thankful for Your Word and for the freedom we have of being able to study Thy Word without fear of persecution. We ask that You would continue to be with us as we continue to study the the book of Nehemiah, that we might have a full understanding of those things that you want us to know so that we can apply it to our lives and live the kind of life you would have us to live. So that we might always look for opportunities to teach and encourage others that they might know the joys of being a Christian before it's everlasting too late. And that we're able to over, to overcome any temptations placed before us by Satan. We're thankful for John for his willingness to prepare. We ask that you'd be with him this morning, that he might have a ready recollection of those things he prepared. And we ask all that you'd be with those of our numbers who have physical ailments, that they might be restored to their health and be able to continue to serve thee as they've done so well in the past. We also ask, Father, that you'd be with those of our numbers who are spiritually sick, those who are spiritually weak, that they might be strengthened, that they might recognize the need to always turn to you. Our world. These things we ask in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. 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 All right, we left off last week in our study um, right around verse 13 of Nehemiah chapter 9. And what I'd like to do this morning is we're going to back up just a little bit and do some reading through here just to remind ourselves of what we looked at last week. And what I'd like to do is actually start in verse 5 there, just a portion of of the way through verse 5. The, um, sometimes your Bibles may have like a topical header uh, somewhere in above the various sections, and one of mine in chapter 9 says spiritual preparation of Israel. Another one says the people confess their sins. And then there about verse 4, we have, uh, I have mine that says the great deliverances of God. And what we're going to see is, as we go through chapter 9 here, and we've already gone a portion of the way through this, is that he's going to give a, a history lesson of sorts of everything that God has done for the people, but he also re- repeatedly references the people's sin, God's punishment, and then their deliverance. He'll do that several times, and it's basically leading up to what he has done for them here. So let's see. Let me make sure we've got everything going as we should over here. Very good. The people confess their sins. That's right. Mine's got that as well in the latter portion there. All right, so let's go ahead, and I'll do the, I'll do the reading in the beginning here as we just kind of do a little bit of review here with this. But notice they're starting partway through verse 5 there. Well, starting from the beginning of verse 5 there. We see in the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, and Hashbani, Sherebiah, and Hoja, and Shibaniah, and Pethiah said. And here's what they said to the people. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Verse 6. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships worships you. Now, in a manner of speaking, let's pause here for just a moment. With verses 5 and 6, where did they begin in their lesson? The beginning. Kind of abbreviation of creation. You think about what they just what he just covered there. So then we start there in verse 7. He says, You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of the Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Girgashites to give it to his descendants. You have performed your words for you are righteous. Then verse 9, you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. 
You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants, and against all the people of his, of his land, for you knew that they acted proudly against them. So you made a name for yourself, as it is this day. Then verse 11, And you divided the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on the, all on the dry land, and their persecutors you threw into the deep as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar, and by night with a pillar of fire, to give them light on the road which they should travel. Then verse 13, you came down also on Mount Sinai, and spoke with them from heaven, and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. All right, let's pause there for a moment, and this kind of brings us up to where we left off last week. We have a brief history here. He talks about Abram. God gave him the name Abraham, made a covenant with him. Then he jumps down to their time period in Egypt. And really, in the history there of the children of Israel, regarding the Egyptian time frame, what was the most important? Their deliverance. You know, God leading them out of Egypt. So he addresses that, brought them through the wilderness there to uh, Mount Sinai, divided the sea of course there so that they could go through there, led them by day with the cloud of pillar, led them by night with the pillar of fire to light the road for them. And then he brings them to Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. Are right, any thoughts so far kind of about this review before we continue with this? What is interesting about this is you'll note that they observed quite clearly that the commandments that the Lord had given to them were what? Notice what he says here. They were just ordinances and true law. There was nothing unjust about what God gave them through the commandments there. They were just ordinances, true laws. They were good statutes and commandments. They were not only good, but they were good for the people. On so many different levels, had the people abided by it, their life would have gone exceedingly well. And did at times when they did obey the Lord there. All right, any thoughts or comments? All right, let's start reading now in verse, let's continue this in verses 14 and 15. Dale, if you would, please. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst and told them to go and to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. Okay. Now, coming back to this here, simple history lesson. Verse 14, he says, You made known to them your what? Holy Sabbath. Holy Sabbath, exactly. And commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by whose hand? Moses. By the hand of Moses. Okay. Now, this is all basic Bible history. And we look at it as basic Bible history for us, but it was basic Bible history for them. And although, and you think about it for just a moment, now this is a very rough date here, but roughly, when did God lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who remembers roughly? Somewhere around 1500 B.C., give or take, depending on what source you look at, you know, right, right around that time period. Um, when approximately, and I don't have my notes that contain that, when approximately was Nehemiah written? Some of your Bibles may say, go back to in the beginnings of it there. I've got between 464 and 423 B.C. So we're, let's just round it to 450, you know, kind of estimate there about 450 B.C. So how many years has gone by, very roughly, obviously, since God led the children of Israel out of the Egyptian captivity? A little over a thousand years, yeah. A little over a thousand years has gone by since this key event here when he led them out of Egyptian bondage. Now, how long has our nation of America been a, a, a nation, a formal nation? 
Yeah, 1776 there. And um, I have to get rid of this marker, it looks like. 1776, and so we are currently in 2012 there. And so we're looking at not quite 300 years. We're somewhere around 250 rounding it, okay? Now, do we still talk about 1776 and the events leading up to that? Sure. And there's a lot of history before this day, okay? But this is when, when we were led out of bondage, if you would, we signed the Declaration of Independence. Now, here's my point. Let us jump forward a thousand years and see if our nation is still talking about this event like Israel was talking about their freedom. You see the point? You know, look, look, out th look, look throughout the histories of the world, especially over in Europe, and go back through your, your, your Western civilization and look at the history there and find events that people are still talking about today that happened a thousand years ago. You know, I mean, they, they are there. They're, they're recorded historically. The Crusades would be one example. A lot of those happened around 1000 AD, you know, give or take and everything. The point is, is that as our nation, will we be speaking about our origins a thousand years from 1776? Very well may not. Someone might, if the world stands that long. There's no telling what the, 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 the world government will, or I say the world government might be by then, <laughs> but no telling what the governmental system will be like at that point. But imagine though, a thousand year history and they're still talking about the deliverance as if it happened yesterday. You know, and, and th there's no doubting it. There's no disputing it. There is full belief in it. No. I think the difference is, though, that God specifically commanded the Israelites to uh, teach their children on a daily basis of mm -hmm. all that he has done for them. And if they are doing what God has commanded, it would be easy to recall these. Okay. The problem is the Israelites kept following and, and walking away and following and walking away. Okay. Uh, but the Sabbath day that was created and made known all the way back in Genesis the third chapter verse two, mm -hmm. uh, the day that God rested. And so if the Israelites, and just as we are today, we may not remember a thousand years from now ever all the events that took place in 1776. But if we are following the word of God, we should remember everything that God has. I think it's a good point. Any other thoughts? Gene? It would, it would seem that uh, if the reason that Ezra gave in the history is because in this length of time, in the time of captivity, and because of their sins, they've forgotten that. Okay. They use that to cause them to remember something which I think they probably had forgotten because they were not keeping the law, they were not keeping the sacrifice, not keeping the feast, they were not, they were not doing things which were part of the original uh, command. And they forgot these things. And I think here the, the, the Ezra is reminding them. I mean, so that's, that to me is part of the reason for what he's recounting history okay. is because they would have forgotten it. And so many generations have been born which may not have been taught as they were suggested when they were commanded to teach them they were sitting down and lying down and sitting and walking in the, in the way and all that sort of thing. So there's a, uh, well, in, in, in 300 plus years, mm -hmm. there's some things about the, the origins of this country that people don't realize and have to be reminded routinely. That's right. That's right. Now, think about this, going back to uh, uh, what Nelson, with what you said. What did God give the people to ensure as long as they consulted it that they would never forget? The law, yeah. But, but during, uh, during Josiah's time, mm -hmm. they were part of the law they didn't even, they thought. That's true. Yeah, and and that, that's the thing about it. And, and this, this says a lot about the providence of God, but also the fact that, that he, I, th I think even through the time period of Judges, there were always a handful of righteous people. You know, it would have had to have been the Levites at least, or at least some of them. It right, would have been a handful of righteous people. But down through this time period, the law was all, always maintained. Now, typically what we refer to as the, the books of the law 
we call them, or in Jewish terms, I guess, they're called the Torah. Okay? And it's the first five books of the law. And so when you know, think about when Dale mentioned that, even going back to the very beginning, we have a reference there to the Sabbath day. Well, when Moses recorded this roughly around 1500, by inspiration, recording that history, he's explaining to the people, for all the, you know, this is why we now keep the Sabbath day holy, going all the way back to the very beginning of this. Now, they, although they often departed from God and they, they even worshipped um, idols um, often, many times, they still kept the contents. I don't mean kept by as in obey, but they still had in their possession the law. And so finally, one more time, they read the law. You know, Ezra stands up and the others, and, and he reads the law, and as we looked at a couple weeks ago, they, the people explained the law to them. And even down to a detailed basis, every, every father of every, of every, um, every head of every family would sit down and be taught the law there. And so because they had it recorded, the first five books at least, plus the other writings of the prophets um, and the history of the kings and everything, they're still able to come back one more time. Now you think about it. And that's why they were able to remember this a thousand years later. It wasn't by word of mouth. It was by the book that had been given, and it was supposed to have been taught by word of mouth. All right, but that, I, I just find it interesting that that's what enabled them a thousand years later to be able to go back. And this is what we're looking at here. You know, how, how did this fellow who's speaking, or these fellows who spoke, how did they know so accurately the events that happened? They had it recorded. And during the 70 years of captivity, there's no telling how many times they went back and consulted and studied, learned maybe from Daniel, maybe learned from Jeremiah. Jeremiah, though, never made the Babylonian. He was carried away into Egypt, wasn't he? I think so, yeah. Ezekiel um, and um, Ezra himself. You know, all these men, Nehemiah, they would have been studying the law. They would have had access to it. These things would have been brought back with them or brought to Babylon with them. And um, Ezra was called the scribe. This, for good reason. Exactly. Yeah. He, he, it was kind of you might, it was the scribe's responsibility to protect, to preserve, and to transmit. Yeah. But the point you made there was always a remnant. That's yes, right. That prophet, there was always a remnant there to bring these people back into remembrance of the things that God intended for them to do. A good example today is if you went to China and some of these uh, third world countries and everything. Mm -hmm. God's word is never going to be destroyed. It will always be there. It may be a very small few people that are doing it underground, hidden from the forces that are trying to stop it, but God's right. word will always survive if mankind will just follow it and have a desire to follow it. That's right. That's Christ exactly right. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Yeah. I've, through the years, I've heard various people in classes comment about the, you know, the, the time period where the, the, the church was, for all intents and purposes, dead. And I never buy that. You know, we, we can't say that from, the, well, let me put it like this. The, the Mormon religion believes that somewhere after 400 A.D., God being so disgusted with how wicked the world was and how the people were perverting his, the, the, the law that he took the church up to heaven. And then finally in the 1800s, he called upon Joseph Smith to reestablish the church here. And some people who look at biblical history, or not biblical history, but church history, and they go back to 800, 900, you know, especially after Pope Boniface, no, Boniface declared himself the first universal pope in 606 B.C. They say, well, you know, that, the, the church of God truly at that point wasn't seen until finally the restoration movement. And I disagree with that. You know, I've, I fully believe that as long as the word was always taught, there was some monastery, there was some friar, there was someone who had access to the word who said, we need to do things this way. Now, they weren't in the great majority. They weren't, you know, huge Catholic <coughs> churches turning to the truth or, or this and that. So they didn't make the pages of history. But I fully believe there was always somebody who was believing the truth and teaching the truth and pra practicing it. Um, and it, and it, that says nothing else, but the, it shows nothing else but the power of the Word of God. And as long as it's read, it will convict someone and be followed by someone. Yeah. Any thoughts or comments? Well, it's not within man to direct his own footsteps. They've proven that through history. That's right. 
<laughs> That's exactly right. Israel, time and time again, brings forth that truth. And oddly enough, no. Who did say that? It's Jeremiah. Jeremiah, kind of reflecting upon the history of his people, draws this conclusion. I was going to say it was Solomon, but I, I remembered real quick it wasn't. All right, so let's see. Let's continue here, and let's start in verse... Oh, uh, one thing I didn't, don't want to forget about verse 15 there. He says that you gave them bread from heaven for their hunger. Now, we're talking about the 40 years of the wilderness there. Uh, what He brought them water from what? From rocks, yeah. You brought water out of the rock for their thirst and told them to go to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. Okay. But, now here's the first instance of their departure and their disobedience. Sister Wilma, would you read for us Verses 16 and 17, please. But they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commands. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they hardened their necks, and in your rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful. Slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. Okay. All right, let's go back here to verse 16 now. I guess the question that we kind of have about this when you look at it, do you think that he is referencing here the sin of the first generation that resulted ultimately in their wandering in the wilderness for 40 years? Okay. Although verses 18, 19, and 20, we'll talk about this here in just, in just a moment there. Um, was not the, the making of the golden calf was not the reason they roamed in the wilderness for 40 years. But it was indicative of the hardness of their heart and the stubbornness that would result in their roaming in the wilderness for 40 years. And so we'll look at that here in just a moment. But notice in verse 16 it says, But they and our fathers acted how? Proudly. Proudly. Uh, hardened their necks. They were unwilling to turn to follow the Lord. They were unwilling to follow his way. Stiff neck uh, would be a phrase that Isaiah would use, that Jesus and Paul were both quotes there. Stiff neck people. And they did not heed his commandments. And not only did they not heed his commandments, but look at verse 17. It says they refused to obey. So you, you think about apostasy even in, in our day and time, apostasy. It comes about when people are unwilling to heed the commandments of the Lord, when people refuse to obey the commandments of the Lord, and when they are no longer mindful of His great wonders. You know, and this says a lot about them. They forgot. They chose not to remember. They were not mindful of all the wonderful things that He had done for them. So they hardened their necks. Um, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage, going back to Egypt. But you are God... Ready to what? Pardon. Pardon. He very well could have said, you know what? Especially think about he came down from Mount Sinai. He very well could have said, okay, we're going to keep a handful of people for the sake of Abraham. And I'm going to destroy everybody else. And we're going to start all over again. He could have done that. You know, and they, they displayed this perpetual... Um, stubbornness and pridefulness. You know, there's so many times the Lord could have said, okay, we're going to start all over again. You know, but he didn't. He pardoned. He was gracious and merciful and slow to anger. Yeah. But if you look at verse 16, uh, specifically where he starts right out, but they and our fathers act proudly. Think about it. Uh, once they left, once they crossed the Red Sea, mm -hmm. it wasn't but just a couple of days before they began to re rebel and claim that God had brought them into this barren land here to die, to, to be destroyed by the Amorites. That's true. And, and this was even before they got to Mount Sinai. They were complaining right. that quickly. Uh, even though God had done everything, he had sent ten plagues, so the Egyptians knew exactly who was in, in charge here, but the Israelites quickly forgot all of that because okay. of the leaders of the, the nation there. Uh, being too proud and, and, and uh, forgetting who, who uh, led them out of bondage. 
I think that's a good point. That's a good point. Any other thoughts? Is that what said something about crying for onions? Crying for onions? <laughs> yeah. <coughs> um, but now, you know, let's don't be too hard on these Israelites. And I'll explain why. And I say this somewhat tongue in cheek there, but I think it gives us an insight to the latter part of verse 17. Think about the people that God has just led out of bondage, okay? When they went down into Egypt, how, how, many, um, how many souls went down into Egypt? Seventy. Seventy. Uh, one passage you look at in the New Testament indicates 75, but it's depending on um, how, you know, how the author there is recounting it. But anyway, 70 souls went down into Egypt. How many people came up out of Egypt? Yeah, it was over yeah, 600,000 plus. Um, because that was 600,000 men on foot. Okay. Very well could have been a million people. And how many years was there in between these two numbers? 400. Yeah, right about 400 years. Now, when they went down, did they have any uh, law? When they went into Egypt, did they have any law? No? Law of the fathers. All right, law of the patriarchs. And so you think about this. The 70 people, some of them are going to be kids, wives, okay? These 70 people who have been given no law, the only law they have is what God has been teaching them along the way, the patriarchal law there. Basically, they know what not to worship and what to worship. Here they spend 400 years in a foreign nation with their gods, a nation who progressively began to um, enslave them and persecute them. Now, they remembered God because Moses came. He says, I, you know, the I am has sent me. And um, they knew that they were not supposed to bow down and worship false gods or anything. So I guess here's the point. We can understand God not wiping them off the face of the earth at their first grumbling. And in a manner of speaking kind of carnally, we can kind of understand how some of them may be <clears throat> would be inclined to grumble when now they've gone from the fire pan into the oven, or however the expression goes. I always say it wrong. Was that right? Fire? That's it, yeah. You know, they've gone from the fire, fire pan, frying pan, into the fire. You know, now they, they, they have, they've let this guy named Moses lead them in rebellion to the Egyptian nation, or against the Egyptian nation, and now they have fled, and now they're stuck. There's a body of water, and here's the army. Now they're seeing great and wondrous things, but it just, for many of them, wasn't enough. Why? They had to be taught more. And I guess that's the point, you know. But now when you jump forward to the people of Israel during Josiah's time, they are without excuse whatsoever because they've had this law for a thousand years, roughly, okay? They've had it for all these years, but yet they still rebel. But these people, you know, whenever I look at these people let out of Egypt, I think about children. And you think about it. In a manner of speaking, they were children. God had to give them a law that was still coming, and they were very immature, wanting to go back to what they knew. They didn't have enough of their own personal history. And you think about this. A lot of times, a lot of these great men that spoke had personal experience. For all of these people, their personal history existed of um, the plagues and um, the, 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 the being led by the, cloud, by, the, by the two clouds and the parting of the waters. Now, that's a lot. But look how stubborn people are. And so anyway, but I think this is why someone says, why didn't, God, why didn't God wipe them off the face of the earth? I think this is the reason. He had patience with them. Anyway, it's just a, a kind of a random thought there. Yeah, but on the other hand, at one time, God did wipe mankind off the face of the earth with the exception of eight souls. Yeah. And that was as pure as it could be at that time. These eight souls all served God. Yeah. Very dedicated. But as time went on, these eight souls began to get watered down their religion and their thoughts and everything because mankind is constantly sinful and, and began to stray away from God. Now they go into the land of Goshen, they're given best land that Egypt has to offer here, mm -hmm. and they, they profit from that. They, 
That's why they grow over 400 years from point A to point B there. Exactly right. Yeah. And so, you know, here's a group of people that begin to, uh, to go back to serving God and everything. Uh, and yet, this same group of people that went back to serving God was still the same group of people who walked away from God every time things didn't quite go their way. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Pat? You made a good case for why a lot of these people that think they would serve God if they could see a miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, untaught people don't always, like you saying from that that scenario you made, that if they're not taught, they have a hard time believing in God and, and really sticking with their commitment to God. So miracles aren't always what can turn a person now I, I do want to clarify and that's a good point i do believe that they were taught but they were taught the oral traditions mm -hmm. the oral history you know of, of abraham and, and how god because when moses came along um you know he was aware of the hebrew people it is often suspected that his mother while she was weaning him during that time period um taught him about his people so they would have had a knowledge of the oral history but there would but there was no codified law, you know, if that makes sense there. Their hearts weren't in it. Yeah, it's, many of them weren't, did yeah, yeah. Rhonda. And God still expected obedience out of them because when they got to the land, they said, you know, but we are but grasshoppers. All right, there you go. They had to die in the wilderness. You yeah. Know? And so they might have been unlearned as far as or unreceptive to God's power, but his expectation was for them to right. obey him. Well, and, and even in the case of when Moses comes down from off Mount Sinai and God finds them worshiping Baal, um, or the, the Egyptian gods, I should say, uh, finds them worshiping the Egyptian gods, he doesn't say, well, we've got to have a little bit of patience with them. No, he destroyed thousands of them. But still, look at the weak-mindedness. when the, Enough of them turned against God. For Joshua to come, out, come down and... And the one who went up with Joshua said, there's the sound of war in the camp. That's how great their partying was. And Joshua says, it's not war. And um, so it, it, either it was a full basket of just bad people that was hip deep in Egyptian practices, or it was a group of people that led the majority. And, many, and even Aaron followed. It's always a remnant. Yeah, <laughs> in that way, in a bad way. You know, we, see the, we see the same problem today. Uh, and Kurt made a good comment in one of his sermons and stood up asking people, do you want to be a Christian or are you? Uh -huh. And the question should be, do you want to go to heaven? Yeah. And this is what the Israelites tell us. Look, they look at the here and now, they didn't look at the future. And we today do the same thing. Somebody makes us mad or something doesn't go quite our way, then we turn away from God. Right. Uh, but we'll still say, well, I'm a Christian. Well, the question is, do you want to go to heaven? If you want to go to heaven, act like it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Don't simply wear a name. You live the life. Right. Yeah. All right, any thoughts? Well, that's a good. You look back a little bit of history, too. Mm -hmm. During the time of Moses and in the time of Joshua, the people fell and, fell and came back, fell and came back, and finally, when Joshua died, he made them commit to God. Right. And they said, we will do his will. And they said, they promised, we and our children. Two generations. That's right. And then we're going again. That's exactly right. Uh, when we look at the story there um, at the start of the book of Judges, yeah. they show what happens when Deuteronomy 6 is not followed. Yeah. Yeah. All right, any other thoughts? Now, again, the, the, the people here reminding them of God's graciousness and his mercy during their time of sin. Okay, And, and th this is very significant, though. And we'll talk more about that as we go through the text there. The key, the latter part of verse 17 says, And God did not what? Did not forsake them. And I think that's very important to understanding uh, what he's showing them here. All right, let's start now in verse 18. And let's see, Miss Betty, would you mind reading for us verses 18 and 19? There you go. Even when they made a molded calf for themselves and said, This is your God that brought you out of Egypt and worked great provocations. Yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of 
but I did not depart from him by day <coughs> to lead them on the road nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. Okay, and Sister Stewart, 20 and 21, please. You also gave them the spirit to instruct them and did that with more than another form of God and gave them one to that thirst. Forty years is the same in the wilderness. They lack nothing. They lack nothing that clothes and not wearing that feet and not swell. Okay. All right, let's go back up here to 18 for just a moment now. Now, this is the history that we've kind of been talking about, you know, as far as in the rebellion there. But even when they made a molded calf for themselves, you know, now let's, let's go back. I don't know how many days specifically, you know, could have been a month, could have been two months. Think back to just, just the other day when God showed his great wonders and powers. Moses is up in the mountain. He's been up there for 40 days. He's not coming down. They say, well, let's make God's. You know, it's, you know, and, and really, who, and, and again, coming back to this time period we're talking about, who was the focal point or the representation of God as far as the people were concerned when they came out of Egypt? Are you talking about Aaron, the priests? Are you talking about or what? Now, who, who was the singular person who would have been the figurehead or the representation of God as far as the people were concerned. Moses. Moses. Now, now, understand the way I'm asking this is God did not manifest himself to them like he did to Moses. Moses saw the backside of God, okay? So when the people heard about God, they heard it from Moses, okay? Not even Aaron at this point, although Aaron was the spokesperson, okay? The mouthpiece. It was always about Moses. Moses had followed. Moses said, you know, God says, I'll, I'll set my people free, etc., etc. Now, the reason why I say this, it shows their limited sight when Moses was gone for 40 days. If Moses was not there, then where was God? And that was the conclusion that they, that they drew. You know, Moses has surely died up in the mountain. Therefore, although they don't say this, but it's implied since Moses died, their representation of God is no longer coming back. So we need to make us a new representation. And they did. When you go back and, 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 and Aaron, when he made the golden calf, they were basically saying, you know, make it, they said, this is the God that brought you up out of Egypt. You know? So, and I'm not saying they were worshiping Moses. I'm just saying they followed Moses because he was the representative in a, in a fashion. And now he's gone. And so they were so, many of them were so short-sighted. And they hadn't, but they hadn't been, well, they hadn't been exposed long enough to, to fully know. And that's what Mount, Mount Sinai was all about. The commandments that, the God, that God was going to give them. You wonder if that's why later in life, David, he says, wait upon the Lord, and he will give you strength. You know, they didn't wait upon the Lord here. You know, and, and right. in David's life, he had learned that. And you wonder if he looked back at these people and he wondered. You know, yeah. they didn't wait upon the Lord. And it, just a little longer. That's you right. He grew so impatient. Sarah didn't wait upon the Lord for his promise. You know, Whenever we get impatient for the Lord's will to take about what we think the Lord's will should be, we are going to fall into sin every time. That's right. Now, one thing I do want to point out, I don't think, I really don't believe that all of the 600,000 plus rebelled. All right. But I think enough of them did that um, the, the right of the speakers here referred to it as a general rebellion, okay? I mean, it's possible that all 600,000 plus, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, you know, rebelled on this day. But I don't think so. I think it was, you had those who were wicked enough, even think about the days of Korah. Did everybody follow Korah? No, no. But anytime there's a rebellion, enough people will follow that the whole pays the price. Um, but again, now having said that, when you go back and look at the text, it does read as if the whole of the camp was punished. You know, when, when they had to drink the water that had the... Um, calf, the ground up calf. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't totally disagree with you, but the thought process is here. I mean, you've got 600,000. You're saying that some of them didn't agree with this. It was Aaron who stood up after the golden calf. Oh, yeah. This is your God. Aaron was the leader 
at this time because Moses was yeah. not there. Aaron didn't take a stand. These few, this remnant that supposedly didn't go along with it, by their mere silence, took a stand yep. and supported the rest of the people. This is the same thing in the church today. Is if those who are God-fearing people maintain their silence and don't stand up when they see wrong, mm-hmm. then they are, in essence, part of the problem. Yeah. Um, that's a very good point there. Any any other thoughts about that? Part Gene. of the rebellion were all those with that 600,000 plus that were over 20. Only those, none of those who were older than 20 survived the 40 years. Well, that's true. That's a very good point. I mean, you know, we'll jump forward in time when they're almost about to go in the land, but everyone 20 and older when they came out of the land. Um, I wanted to check on something that I'm, I'm remembering, and I want to make sure that I don't remember incorrectly. Uh, let's see. What I want, look in your Bibles here, help me for just a minute. We're going to go back to the instance of this rebellion, and I think it's going to be after. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Um, Mm-hmm. Now, notice here, after this takes place, he comes down, he sees everything happening. Look. All right, look at verse 25 there of Exodus chapter 32. And I'll bring it up here on the screen here for just a moment. Exodus 25, there in verse 32. Okay, I'm trying to get the switcher going here. Yeah, uh, 32.25. Thank you. I just did. Well, I've got to read a long ways, don't I? To get to the right one. All right. So here we have Moses standing before the people. There we go. When Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them. This goes back to what Bell said there. To their shame among the enemies. Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. So this suggests maybe that the Levites were not in support of what was going on. Although Aaron did not restrain the people. It suggests that there were some. I, I I don't think you have... Uh, the sons of Levi who stood back and were cowering and everything. And then Moses said, well, if you're on the Lord's side, step over here. Now, that's speculation clearly on my part there. But So he said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. All right, so then Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today in the Lord that he may bestow on you a blessing this day. Now my point is, he clearly identifies Aaron as being unwilling to restrain the people. But it, I think there is a suggestion here when he calls the sons of Levi to go throughout the camp killing people. I think there is a suggestion there that maybe the sons of Levi were not in agreement with what was being done with the golden calf. That maybe they did try to restrain the people, but Aaron did not. And as a result, they were on the Lord's side there. Now, the reason I bring it up is that it does suggest that that not everybody was, was going along with this. That the key people were, and that's what was so tragic. Had Aaron stood up and restrained the people... Dale made a good point. The people in lieu, in the absence of Moses was following Aaron. And Aaron very well could have put a stop to this thing. And he would have had all the sons of Levi standing by his side backing him up. Um, now that is speculation though because it doesn't really go into that much detail as far as to who was opposed. It just names Aaron as the one who did not restrain the people there. But the Levites, even at this time period, were... Um, well, no. If there was any official selecting of the Levites to be the special, you know, rep, like priesthood, um, we have no record of it because it's the giving of the law where that is then established. There. But anyway, I just want to, here's an example possibly of people who were not going along with this. Well, the only 
possibly. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, you think about it. If you have 3,000 people, I don't know how big the camp was. If you have 3,000 people pushing and, and doing for all this, that's going to make a big commotion. I mean, and when you come down, Moses is going to observe that the people were unrestrained. You know, and, I, and then, um, but, but then when you go farther, though, in this, on the punishment side of it, um, let's see, where is it? He, he um, destroys the... Yeah. There in verse 35, then the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. So the people in general suffered because of what those people did, you know. And uh, so I guess it goes to it, it goes to to show that even not speaking out is just as wrong as being a party to what's being done. You know, because you, can you think about if the majority of the people had, they could have put a stop to this, but they didn't. You know, there probably was, you know, a group of people who were the ringleaders, the 3,000, all right, but still it implies that many, many people went, went along with it, or at least didn't put a stop to it. Well, this is why I say, even in my mind, the Levites went along with it too by their mere silence. Well, they, well, when Moses came back down and, and made the statement, They can stand up. They're now brave once again. Interesting. Because the leader is here, the, the uh, one God had chosen to lead them out of bondage is yeah. here now. So now they can stand up. But before then, they were silent. So it could be speculated either way then, that, that either the Levites were opposing what was being done but not being heard, or they were being silent. And now that Moses was back, were willing to step up to the plate there. It's just interesting that, that here they were cowardly, and when Moses is back, they're willing to draw swords. I just like to think that, I mean, these things, and John tells us that, you know, there are many things that were done that's not yeah. recorded. Right. These things were recorded for our learning. I'd like to think that if these Levites stood up and fought this situation, that it would have been recorded for our understanding to know that we, as uh, children of God, should and, and must take a stand for God when things are not right. That's possible. That's possible. Yeah. Um, Ms. Phyllis, did you have your hand up? Yes. I'm just thinking, and this might be politically incorrect, but. <laughs> We're all about political incorrectness here. <laughs> yeah. about national identity. If America were to take place in something horrible uh -huh. against some other country, and our government perpetrated it, and we didn't all agree with it, and we were against it, but. Something bad were to come of it. People were to look down on America. Hopefully, most of the people would stand aside and say, I'm not an American. That was horrible. I mean, everybody would accept the shame, even if they weren't for it. You know, you would, you would grieve over what your country had done. Because you would be part of that country, whether you had done it or not. Well, that, that's kind of all about war. I mean, you know, how many times in, in conflict do civilians not get killed? You know, they, they pay the price for the government's stupidity to start it, you know, and the ones whose government rise up to defend them, there will be people who will pay the price for it. And, uh, let's see, Ms. Uh, Pat, you had your hand up, and then Ms. Betty, and then Mr. Jean. Uh, well, for one thing, there was a lot of Egyptians among them which did worship a calf, which they, I'm sure, incited a lot of this. But they still don't have the excuse well, to do it. Well, in the Charlton Heston movie, they, they really yeah. emphasize that point. Yeah, well, yeah. and it's a true fact. But that, that's right. They, they, some did come out with them. That's a good point. But they also, this verse 20 is where they burned the calf and had the people. But then Moses, in 21, it says, And Moses said to Aaron, What did, you, what did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? And so he's putting some blame on Aaron for building this camp That's right. for them, for listening yeah. to the people and not just standing up. It's kind of like what they always saying, stand up. That's right. 
Well, and Aaron did stand up. He's the one that said, this is your God. Yeah. <laughs> but he also built it. But you're right, though. Verse 20 is where he causes the people to drink the water, yeah. and then God plagued them as, as a result of it, of their sin, too. Okay. Um, anything else, Ms. Pat? And it says in 25 that, they, that Aaron didn't restrain them. Right. When Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among yeah. their the, enemies. The, this, this, this isn't so much a step-by-step step recording. The he didn't restrain them among their enemies. Yeah. That's talking about the Egyptians, I think, were among them, and, and he didn't bring glory to God. Okay. ESV in, version, right? In verse, yeah, it's in verse 25. Yeah. New King James says something. I got New King James. I got Nick and James now. I switch all the time. Okay, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies. Very Which good point. Would have been, uh, the Egyptians. Egyptians among them, and they, he didn't yeah. stand up for God. Very. That's right. That's right. Miss Betty, see Miss Wilma. I don't remember so. Somebody help me out. I can go back and read for myself. But Aaron's still giving to be my Moses' servant. Yeah. 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 Yeah when Moses was in Egypt going to say, let my people go and talk to the people. You know, Aaron did continue his task, but he was really more instrumental in the early stages of it, at least, I think. Was any um, priest? Yeah, because of a priest. And, and what is interesting, I said, well, go the priesthood had not yet been established, but who was it who stood up when Moses said, who's on the Lord's side? The sons of Levi. Yeah, and they would end up being the priesthood. And, Moses, and Aaron was charged with the responsibility of, of not, of, or in this case, the responsibility of not restraining him, which implies he should have. Um, Gene? Yeah, just a historical comment. Back to your mm -hmm. comment made earlier that uh, if, if people don't like what's happening, then they can make a change. In 1941, if it had not been for World War II, this country would have ended up in anarchy. It was headed that way. Okay. And, but the people, citizens, rebelled against that. Yeah. So that's what can happen when you stand up, take your position, and support. That's, that's right. Ended. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. All right, any other thoughts? Where would the church be had someone not stood up for it? <laughs> That's what Gene's saying. Yeah. Somebody has to stand. And as you were saying earlier, the, the people as a whole were uneducated towards what was really going on. And Aaron should have been the one out of all of them because he had been with Moses, seen the miracles, had gone up against Pharaoh and seen the miracles for standing. He should have, out of all the people that were down there, he should have been the one to say, stop. Yeah. And that's why... He's the one I think pointed out that the one that had the knowledge, the the the, the insight, actual workings of God's hand, was the one that didn't speak up. Well, now let me. Okay, I think that's a very good point. But let's consider something. I did mention a while ago that it would have been their oral traditions they would have passed down. Okay, and that their limited that, that all of their lives would have been limited history with God. There's no recorded interaction between God and the people when they were in Egypt. Okay, no recorded interaction there. But within a short period of time there, he put up this huge flag in front of them of his great power. All the way from the, from the plagues to saving the firstborn and killing the firstborn of the Egyptians. And even when they were there worshiping these gods, more than likely the, the, the cloud of fire was still burning. You think about it, you know, and, 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 I, and I, I'd have to go back and look and see when it quit leading them, but not until the, the land of Canaan. So over here you still have, so I guess what I'm saying is that there, was, that there wasn't, here's something great, now y'all need to remember it. There was a continuing reminder with that cloud of fire of God's power. So, you know, there, there, he put up a big enough flag that they had no excuse, if that makes wow. sense, you know. They, they, they were without excuse. Yeah. Aaron kind of gives us the feeling of we can make, I mean, it's, it's understandable we're going to make mistakes. Right. We've got to pick up and keep following God. We can't just give up and say, well, we're just a mess and we can't do it. We've got to say, I'm sorry, God, and help me, and I'll continue. So Aaron's good. 
It's a good example of what not to be, but what to be. Yeah. Well, we're told to be able to give an answer for the hope that lies within us, or give a defense for the hope that lies within us. Even Which, great people make mistakes, though. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes they're great mistakes. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> All right, Jim. <laughs> you mentioned uh, in the early days of their, prior to their captivity, there's no evidence of God being, God's influence in Egypt because of how he promoted and, and, and protected Joseph. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So the, the presence of God was there. I guess, I guess the point I, w I would wonder is the, the last 50, 60, 70 years leading up to the, you know, at, at that point, the, the way they would have to look at it is, man, we're still being, we're slaves and we're having to make bricks, but we're still popping children out right and left and, you know, our land is very fertile down here and, and I mean, so that, that would be the positive way of looking at God's still blessing them, having to look past the, the, the slavery at the moment. And that, that's what Pharaoh observed. You know, we tried to bring down hard burdens on these people, but they still keep multiplying. I mean, they still keep growing, and so that would have been a, a sure sign if the people were willing to look at it, you know. And I think they did. I, I just think that, and I think someone, when you made a point earlier, is an excellent point. They had the influence of the Egyptians that traveled with them, you know. And then you had the weak-minded influence of those people who knew better but were unwilling to do anything. And then you had Aaron saying, okay, let's do this. You know, it, but in the end, it resulted in a great, a, a, just so many great displays where God, like children, punished them to get them to walk straight. You, know. you must fall in love with God or you won't serve him correctly. He wants your heart. That's true, completely. And they didn't yeah. give him their heart. They were just trying to serve out of their own strength that, that was within them and it just wouldn't work because they'd fall on their faces because of their own strength wasn't there. It, it yeah. wasn't what God could work with. <laughs> they were almost like an unbroken horse, yeah. if, if that would make true. sense. No, it does make sense. You know, no, in does. some way, and they had to be broken and tamed, and, and that's what the law is going to do. So. Thank God for his love. <laughs> yeah. All right, any other thoughts or comments? I appreciate all the good discussion there with that. Let's plan next Lord's Day morning to resume this. And I want to take a little bit of time like we have with this, because... What did I say? Lord's name on it. Well, I'm sure it'll be a day the Lord, Lord makes, but yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Next Tuesday, when the Lord makes next Tuesday, we'll, yeah. um, well, let's plan to continue this, and we will start there in verse, um, well, not Exodus 32, 25. <laughs> Uh, 34? Maybe. Yeah, let's start there in oh, Nehemiah chapter 9. Yeah, I gotta get over Nehemiah. Yeah, did we get that far? That's right, that's what we read last there. Okay, so yeah, let, I appreciate that. Let's start there in verse 19. I think it'll be a good starting point. Um, and. Um, yeah, we we weren't. Yeah, we, we read eighteen through twenty one, so we'll go back and kind of discuss a little bit. Then we'll, we'll pick in. Yeah, we took a detour around Mount Sinai for a few minutes. This morning. I was. I did too. I back up there. Yeah. Um, I appreciate all the participation comments and. Remember tonight at 7.30 p.m. is a Scripture Way broadcast um, at scriptureway.org. And um, we have several who have joined us this morning. Appreciate you being here with us and on the Internet for the study. And let's go ahead and be dismissed in a word of prayer. And Gene, would you mind doing that? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we come together as our children to study in that word. To understand the wisdom that we find in that Pray that we might always obey it, but not always follow it, not always teach others by our example. And we might prepare ourselves for that promise which thou made in the life which is to come. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>